<laughs> so we, Tom presented a micro micro view of 100% uh, renewable, and I'm going to take the other extreme and go from a macro perspective. But it's totally compatible with what uh, Tom said. There is no. It's just another way to look at it. And the common denominator is electricity. Electricity will be a carrier of taking us very far into big solar. So in my research, I've been oh the arrows only. Okay. Yep. So well, that's fine. So everything I've done since I started doing research was to try to make solar bigger. So I'm going to present uh, one way that I think could get us there sooner than later. <coughs> so. We all know solar is really big, right? It's the biggest energy resource of the planet by far, much bigger than all the finite resources we have that are driving the economy, and also orders of magnitude bigger than any renewables that you can name up, including wind. And it's uh, if we are going to grow the economy for a very, very long time, you look at the size of the energy we're consuming, it's, it's about a thousand times bigger. So. Why don't we have big solar yet, since it's such a big, big resource? Traditionally, there has been two things in the way of big solar. One has been cost, and the other one is intermittency of the resource. Cost has been dropping uh, very significantly to the point where you can, on a straight energy basis, you can deliver solar kilowatt hours less around five cents per kilowatt hour today without any incentive whatsoever, without ITC. So costs may no longer be an issue at all on a straight energy basis. Intermittency is still an issue. Sun doesn't shine at night and it looks like that in many days and it doesn't deliver the type of electricity that a utility profile you want. So how do we go from the resource to the product we need. So let's start by looking at what solar does to an electrical load. That's the load of New York City for 20 days in summer, night day, night day, heat wave in the middle, they reach peaks. And let's see what happens when we put a little bit of solar on that. So if I put just a little bit of solar on New York grid, it looks really, really good. I'm, I'm doing peak shaving, high value solar, high capacity credit works very well. And when I put more and more solar on that New York City grid, I'm still doing well, but I'm still starting to, to miss a little bit that red part, that solar. I have to find some other way to deal with it. And the more solar I put on the grid, the, the bigger the problem. And here you will notice a very familiar curve, <laughs> that famous duck that doesn't exist only in California, but also every utility grid will have its duck with its uh, impossible quote-unquote ramp rates. But the more solar you put, then you reach the bigger duck. You reach the Loch Ness Monster stage that Tom was mentioning. But even if you're going to reach 100%, you see it's, it's an elephant to deal with. That red part is what solar doesn't supply to you. That's what has to be dealt with if you want to go 100% solar. So how do we fill that red with a yellow? I think there are five solutions to that. One of which is uh, load management, load shaping. So if you entice people to use power when solar is available, you can actually transform the load profile. And that's what I'm doing here in that simulation. Yeah. And when I do that, you can see the red part has been cut nearly in half, just by changing the, the way uh, we, we use power, by using power when sun is available. Number two is, of course, storage. This one is easy, easy to figure out. You, when you overproduce, you can use that power later at night. And the technologies to do that are evolving very fast. Batteries and flow batteries coupled with electric transportation is a, is a booming technology. 
large scale, you have compressed air, and you have, of course, the elusive uh, holy grail of hydrogen. I don't know if it will happen, but... And some very exciting things happening also with the gravity large scale based systems. Not only pumped hydro, but other very exciting uh, new technologies. Third is to try to exploit uh, synergies with other renewables, in particular wind, because they tend to be in opposition of phase, both on a seasonal and a daily trend. Another one is interconnection. When you spread the resource over an area, you actually can get a much cleaner solar. This is the solar resource for New York City, so for one year. So you have your cloudy days, your clear, clear days, and if, if you're a utility, you look at that as a power supply, you're really afraid that you don't trust that stuff. It's on and off all the time. Now, if you spread that resource, I'm taking it to the extreme here, for the entire US, that's what it's <coughs> going to look like. You do away with the weather. All you're left is the season. It's a very clean resource. And if you take it even further and you connect North and South America, this is what the solar supply looks like. It's, it's like a nuclear power plant. It's constant all the time, always. And the last but not least is output curtailment. So this is again my single CD output, very noisy. But if I tell myself I'm going to reject all my excess energy, I'm going to take only 50% of, of that output. I, I, I don't need 100% of my solar output. I can live with 50%. And you see that signal is a lot cleaner. It's almost also a flat loading output that you get. <coughs> And with the cost of PV going down, as it has been doing and will probably continue for the foreseeable future, it, it may not be a problem to decide of the, if you can get higher value from that cleaner supply to actually just waste or, or lose it. And in fact, we're doing it right now. The sun is shining and we're losing 99% of it. So we're just going to lose a little bit through the PV system. But what we're going to get in the end will be clean. So not any one of them will do it alone, but if you put them all together, I think we can get to 100% economically. And in fact, let's look at the, at the numbers now. How much will it cost? And I'm not going to put wind in that. I'm just going to look at uh, storage, interconnection, curtainment, and load shaping, and see the cost of a kilowatt hour generated when you put all that together. And I'm stealing that picture from uh, my son's uh, PhD thesis at Columbia. So this, this simulation is not mine, but I checked the numbers and they are pretty solid. <laughs> so what does it cost to do the equivalent of nuclear power generation with PV in the central US? So you're outputting a flat output 100% of the time instead of having that weather-driven variability. If you do it with storage alone, you're gonna to have to build giant storage reserve to get you through seasons and, and cloudy days. So the kilowatt hour at the end is going to be totally unaffordable. It's gonna be over a dollar per kilowatt hour. That's not gonna work by itself. If you couple storage with uh, geographic dispersion, and here the other dis dispersion is about uh, 1,000 kilometer radius in the central US, so about three, four times the size of Texas, you can already cut on your storage requirements by coupling them together. If you couple storage and curtailment and try to get the best LCOE you can, you can see that curtailment is actually very, very uh, strong catalyst of getting the cost down. If you put the three together, you have about 23 cents per kilowatt hour. Now that 23 cent was achieved with a turnkey PV of 225 a watt, which is the, more or less what you can do today on a large scale PV. If we are taking PV at $1 a watt, which is the sunshot objective, we are getting down to 18 cents per kilowatt hour. And finally, if we are coupling that with a smart demand side management with load shaping, you're down to delivering firm kilowatt hours the equivalent of nuclear power plant at eight cents a kilowatt hour. And this, anybody can buy. So, action, since that's in the title of uh, today's session, 
How do, how do we get there? How do we make that happen? How do we enable those solutions on, on a large scale? And for me, the part of the answer and most of the answer lies in the way of remuneration and tariffs. On the supply side, you need a, a system that is smart to remunerate PV outputs. Um, I think that system is for value of solar tariffs because they will enable, you will actually deliver, pay the value of solar to the value that's delivered on the grid, including capacity value, energy value, everything else, as well as the cost of, of putting those solutions that will enable a large amount of PV. We promote intelligent systems that are capable of being curtailed in real time, that have storage on board to be dispatched in real time. And on the demand side, you need a load shaping tariff that will entice uh, electricity customers to use power when sunshine is available. So you will transform the demand profile into a demand profile which is more prone to accept larger amounts of solar on the grid. And I think uh, those two things, we can think big solar in a, in a big way. Um, and we have a, a project in the Northeast US having 11 states, it's called the Northeast uh, Solar Energy Market Coalition with Pace Energy, where we are trying actually to bring those concepts forward as a pilot demonstration in, in the Northeast. So big solar, I think it's doable. It's, it's economic, but if uh, if we don't do the, the right steps, we're going to be stuck with uh, the current uh, <laughs> current view, which is the view of everybody else. But the fossil fuel industry they want us to stay there, but it's it may be the view also of some in the solar industry. They lack the, the, the for me the net metering has has to go out of the picture mm -hmm. in one way or the other yeah. because it's. A, it's a system that was not designed for solar. It's, it's a demand thing that was created many, many years ago for power supply, for delivering, buying power from the utility companies. And surfing with solar on top of that system was good. It's good as long as you stay under the radar screen. If solar is to grow, it's going to break that system. Um, so net metering is part of, of that of that view, in, in my opinion. So, thank you for your attention. So, you're not talking compressed air storage. No. You're talking... Uh, I, I see it as, as one, one of the possible technologies. Yeah, I didn't put it in my list. I think it's a favorite technology of many in Europe yeah. because the infrastructure is in place to do that and some big company like GDS, US and all that, that's, that's part of their business plan, so they will naturally fall into that. For me, it, it may not be necessary to go there. We, we may not need, need that much storage so distributed storage, batteries, and for the large scale storage, there are all kinds of technology. So power to gas is definitely part of, of that big picture, but it's probably not the only one. So I'm agnostic on this one, yeah. Yeah. Um, how much does the wind synergy drop at um, dollar twelve or kilowatt hour? So we didn't do the simulation with with wind data, we're planning to do that in a, in a project we have with the island of La Reunion in, in the Indian Ocean, where we're, we're going to look at 100%. And there will be both the wind and, and the solar. So that's was solar only. I'd say wind wind will, at least on the on the big side of the numbers, will drop those numbers by 30 to 40%. That's my gut feeling. Too. Sorry, I'm on the geographic district. Version. Um, is that savings net of the cost of transmission? That that includes the, the cost of upgrading the grid to to make it. Yeah. So all costs included. So you reinforce the grid to be capable of, of uh, spreading PD power 
over a radius of 1,000 kilometers in that case, yeah. That increase with reinforcement. Um, in Hawaii, some of your predictions like net metering not working it have already come true. The, the, they are very much struggling. They're leading the world in per capita mm -hmm. PV, and they've actually had to decline most permit installations for about three years now. Yep. And it occurs to me that your ideas would find a wonderful test bed there because they are struggling for what to do. So I'm wondering, have you ever had contact with those people? Well, it's like everything. I think we approach those people with, it, with that very concept about two years ago that maybe we knocked at the wrong door and people are not listening. But if you, someone is willing Okay, to after this them, over, we can yeah. maybe get you in touch with some people because they are desperate for ideas and it seems like this is perfect fit. Sure thing, yeah. I agree sure. with you. Yeah, one more question and then we have to, to go. So, um, I think he yeah. had his hand up. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, your assumption on tariffs right, uh, for supplying electricity to users, uh, does that assume uh, doing away with uh, our current revenue collection, uh, demand charges, and moving to a time of use uh, uh, rate structure pretty exclusively? So for the, for the load shaping tariff, yeah. that's, there are two tariffs in there. There is the, the supply, which is a PV, so you're paid for the energy you put on the grid, and the other one is the is a customer tariff. So it's the equivalent of utility bill. It would be it would be a time of use type, but a, t a time of use which would be a solar time of use. So it's not going to be only time of day. It's going to be is sunshine available on the, on the grid now or not? So cloudy days probably energy will be a little more expensive than on on non cloudy days, and that will force people into into charging their vehicles, preferably when, it, when it's sunny than, than when it's cloudy. I, I think with everything coming without, those things could happen. So the worry that the utilities is fast about solar electric charging, right, creating un, un, you know, high I, demand I think it's, is yes, gone. It's, it's gone. And it's very friendly to utility that talk. Yeah. Utilities like it a lot when, when I talk about that. And, and solar, solar thermal, instead of being charged at night and there's no demand charge, will now be able to be charged during, during certain periods of the day mm -hmm. during peak solar production. Yep. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, Richard. I, what I would like to do is get all the panelists a chance to talk, and then I hope we have some time at the end to have a general discussion, too. So if you have some other additional questions, please uh, don't re, you know, keep them in mind, and we'll um, have some time at the end for further discussion. Maybe I somehow get this thing.